So it turns out, we've been increasing the speed of technology so quick, we might have to start changing the way we do things around here. Hmm. So first, to start off, we're going to be talking a lot about Moore's Law. And you might ask, well, what's Moore's Law? Um, Moore's Law is not so much like a law of the universe, so much as just like a law postulated by a guy. His name was Gordon Moore. Um, he was one of the founders of Intel. But he sort of predicted in the 1960s that the number of transistors on a CPU as it relates to technology would double every two years. So if it started at 20, two years later it would be 40, two years later it would be 80, and so on. Um, and the interesting part about this is that transistors are essentially the, the discrete unit on a processor that determines how many independent calculations it can make. Um, there's more nuance than that, that's kind of a gross oversimplification, but think of a transistor on a CPU as just like raw computing power. Um, and Moore's Law, for kind of representing it in visual terms that it might be easier to understand, he basically was postulating that the number of transistors that you could fit on an individual CPU was just going to shrink and shrink and shrink. So if when we started it was the equivalent of having 90 point font on a piece of paper, as time progressed it would suddenly be 45 point font and you could fit twice as much text. And then it would be 30 point and 20 point and 10 point and we were just making the, the size of the information smaller and smaller, allowing more of the information to fit on the same uh, discrete space or unit of space on the processor. Um, so you'd be getting a lot more done by shrinking the size. Um, and so with this in mind, you might be thinking, okay, well then what's a transistor? Um, back when these were first made in 1947, um, William Shockley, John Bardeen, and uh, Walter Bretain, Bretain, not sure how to say that, um, came up with a little piece of technology that is really one of the greatest inventions of all time, even though we don't really talk about it that often, but it allowed sort of computers to begin to be able to think. This little transistor essentially amplifies a signal. So if you send in electricity on one side, you can then increase it on the other side uh, by way of adding electrons or adding electricity. Um, and by virtue of being able to amplify a signal like that, like say, a microphone sending in a signal that then gets amplified to be louder out of a speaker, um, which is where the amp and amplifier comes from. Um, to amplify that signal, you could also just cut off the electricity and prevent the signal from going through altogether. And this whole idea sort of leads you to the key revelation of sort of a zero or a one. Like if you can control the flow of electricity, you can then control a signal, how much of a signal gets through, or if a signal gets through altogether. Um, and this yes or no, on or off thing is kind of the whole binary way that computers do calculations. So the yes or the no is the one or the zero. If you've ever th heard of binary code or um, seen, you know, little matrixy ones and zeros flying everywhere to represent computer code, that's how computers think. Um, and again, it's a gro gross oversimplification. I will include a video probably somewhere or down in the links below that explains transistors in more detail if you're curious. But just for virtue of understanding what's about to come, just know that transistors equal computing power, and the more of them you have, the quicker, uh, more intense calculations you can do, the more concurrent calculations you can do on a CPU. So, if we look at a graph of Moore's Law, um, as it played out, it actually held consistently true from the moment that he proclaimed it in the 60s all the way up until around today. Um, and that's really bonkers because as you start to duplicate and keep doubling of the number of transistors you have, you quickly get into the millions, billions, trillions range, and that's where we are today. So I've got a whole other, vid other video called um, The Speed of Technology, which shows kind of how we went from kind of the 1980s when there weren't really much going on, all the way up till today where now it, the number of transistors on a CPU is around 23 billion. Um, and it's insane to think that you have 23 billion of something in your pocket if you're carrying around a smartphone. Um, but these 23 billion transistors are quickly getting to the point where they are so small um, 
they kind of behave outside of the, the qualities of the universe. Like, we can't prevent electricity from flowing through them the way that we're used to, because they're so tiny that electrons just pass through the gate um, without obeying sort of the laws of physics as we understand them. Um, and so, to give you an idea of how, just in a condensed form, how crazy it is to go from essentially zero transistors to 23 billion transistors over the span of like 30, 40 years. Um, like, just take a look at a chart like this of how many years it took for each product to gain roughly 50 million users. Um, back when the airplane first came out, that took 68 years before 50 million people had used an airplane. Um, you got cars, 62 years, telephone, 50 years, electricity, 46 years. Um, all the way down the line, you see this sort of condensing of technology to where upon the release of Pokemon Go, it only took 19 days for 50 million people to use it, um, which is just crazy. This, this rapid condensing and amplification almost of the adoption of technology. Um, there's also a really cool video that somebody visualized the data here of uh, the development of Bitcoin over the ages. They took the, the number of commits to the Bitcoin repository on GitHub, I believe, and mapped out what that looks like as all the different users sort of come in and add. And just watching that build out in almost a neural network kind of way is just insanely interesting to watch. Um, or just something like this, where uh, this guy on Twitter is remarking on the state of the Lightning Network for um, crypto going from where it was in January of 2018 to December of 2018, you can just see that insane amplification in the number of uh, nodes and overall commits and users, um, which, you know, I might do another video on that whole topic later, but for the sake of this, you can just see here very, very plainly that technology is just exploding in a very rapid way. Um, and so what's interesting to me about that is that you took something like a smartphone and you took all this technology and just shrunk it down to the point where we have like three to five billion transistors in a, in a regular smartphone by today's standards as of this filming in late 2019. Um, and so you're walking around with billions upon billions of little calculations going around in your pocket. Um, and it's a number that gets so high, it's hard to even conceptualize. So just as a way to, to help you frame that up, if you think of it this way, a million seconds is 11 days and 14 hours, whereas a billion seconds is 31 years and eight months. I like this painting. Is it sperm? No, three commas. Know what has three commas in it, Richard? Uh, a sentence with two a positive phrases in it? No, a billion dollars. Yeah, I'm in the three comma club. So you really are, you're walking around with three billion of something that humans made in your pocket. Like that's just insane. Um, but as we keep amplifying this up, we've actually gone from, I, I usually say like an M to a B to a T, like we've outpaced the billions and some of the processors that are in desktops nowadays go all the way up to uh, 23 billion processors. Like we're, we're quickly approaching trillion if we keep doubling at this rate. If it keeps going like this over the next three, four months, we could be talking the four comma club. That's a T, not a B, Richard. No, um, and just to give you a sense of what that would be, a trillion seconds would be 31,710 years. So to go from a million to a billion to a trillion is not an inconsequential thing. Um, but in a, the human mind, we kind of just, you know, it all just disappears. You get million, billion, trillion, they all kind of sound the same. You can't really wrap your head, head around how big of a difference that is. But the orders of magnitude of difference every time we double is just staggering. Um, but Moore's law predicted that these would just keep doubling and doubling and doubling seemingly forever. The problem is as we approach the late 2019, 2020, all the way up to about 2025, as I mentioned, the scale of the transistor keeps getting tinier and tinier. So what began as the size of like, essentially like a credit card, like a large transistor, we've shrank it and shrank it down to the point where the current um, scale of these things is in the nanometers um, and if you ever look up any processors or anything or see any technology lists online um, it'll say that like this chip was built on a 10 nanometer set or a 14 or a 7. Um, 7 nanometers effectively means when you look at a super close-up version of what that physical transistor looks like on the chip where you have a source and a drain and again go watch videos on transistors below if you're more into this sort of thing but essentially 
the electricity has to come in from the source, pass across a little silicon um, barrier there, and then leave via the drain. And you apply a charge to the top of either positive or none to facilitate the electrons passing through the transistor. Um, but we have made these things so tiny, down to seven nanometers, that when electricity is applied to them, if they get any smaller, it just sort of moves from the source to the drain without our ability to put that gate in between it. So we really have hit the, the extent of the universe, and that sounds super weird to say, but you we're having trouble making these any smaller because they don't behave correctly at a smaller scale. Um, I mean, I am more than happy to be proven wrong if in you know 2020 or 2021 we have some insane breakthrough and we get down to like three nanometers or something. But as of right now, we are really struggling with the seven nanometer size, which is why you've seen uh, processor speeds kind of ramp up really quickly and then level off because we can only make them so fast now. Um, and there's a really interesting documentary about this phenomenon uh, about a place in China called Shenzhen, which is just a community of people taking all of this hyper-available tech and just using it for all sorts of crazy things, like with hardware and software and really sort of niche implementations. Um, and I would encourage you to go watch that whole thing. Uh, but here's a little clip about it as it relates to Moore's Law. And what you see is now that Silicon Valley, the whole tech ecosystem is sort of like driven as far as the road goes, and now Moore's Law sort of end, is ending or ended, and the car is still kind of gliding off the cliff, right? But there's no more road underneath it. <laughs> and, and they're like, huh, like computers just aren't getting that much faster anymore. And so now you're seeing people going through a phase of optimization, which is great. But at the same time, people are like, okay, well, how do we differentiate my product, right? Like, optimization sucks. That's not a great business model. Because now we have supercomputers in our pocket. Now the question is, what do we do with it, right? And what does that thing in my pocket not already do? And so people are realizing there's niche markets for hardware. We need to have a small accessory. I'm gonna have like my Fitbit, all these little things, my little digital locks, my smart homes, my sensor networks, the IoT sort of stuff coming up. And they say, great, we need to figure out how to build this. And now they're coming back to this ecosystem and being like, oh, you guys know how to solder. We forgot about that. That's really good. Can you help us build these things? So all of that said, why does any of this matter? Um, specifically, just as a human, it matters because if you ask me, and I don't feel like this is some broad sort of futurologist claim so much as it is almost objectively true at this point, humanity is entering a new age. And you watching this right now, approximately around 2019, are around to see it happen. And that's just crazy. Like you are incredibly fortunate to be around while this is taking place. Because um, if we look at it over the, the span of all human evolution, essentially, you've got the hunter-gatherer age, which was you know, millions of years, hundred, one plus million years of fighting for survival against the elements, hunter gathering, chasing down animals, all that great stuff. And then after that, those millions of years, we had the agricultural age where you took thousand year spans. So again, kind of a, a tenthing or a, a cutting down of the, the span, thousands of years of agricultural adaptation and winning over the land, having abundance of resources and starting to build cities and towns and moving into more of an agricultural space. And then after that, you sort of truncate from thousands of years down to hundreds or even just centuries uh, of the industrial age where we took over machines and sort of outpaced the ability of our bodies to make factories and large complex machines do industrious things for us. And that lasted, like I said, about a couple hundred years. And then now we've moved effectively into the information age uh, with the birth of the computer. And this has been about 10 plus years, maybe a couple decades from the 1980s essentially until now. Um, and if you go watch that Speed of Technology video, that details that whole thing. Um, but what's happened as we sort of exit the information age is we're hitting an age that we don't really have a name for now. Um, I've heard some people online refer to it as the augmentation age or the automation age. Um, and essentially in the same way that we took the industrial uh, revolution and were able to do things in order of magnitude larger than the physical capabilities of our body, um, like with factories and automated processes, physically automated processes, we are in the augmentation age escaping the capability of our own brain. So we're kind of now getting past our 
cognitive ability as humans, and it's starting to just explode at a rate that's hard to even keep track of. Um, and a really interesting way to think about this, I think, uh, linked to all the lectures where all this information came from down below. Um, somebody started their lecture by saying, you know, like, are you an augmented cyborg? Um, and most people hearing that would be like, huh, no, of course not. Uh, but if you think about it, I could say to you, what's the atomic weight of barium? And you would quickly just kind of pull up your phone and go, and then you'd have the answer. Um, our tool is still very much passive to get that information, but all of us are augmented in a, in a very fundamental way in that we can have access to the whole wealth of human knowledge at our fingerprint, at our fingertips, or more broadly, just through the internet in general. Um, I, granted, there's a case there to be made for the fact that you have to validate the information and figure out what's true and not true and all of that, but the information is out there and it is a very simple route for most people in the industrialized world to find it. So, uh, in the way that movies like uh, Ready Player One postulate this sort of weird, crazy VR that we're going to have in 10 years of people like walking on treadmills and having fully realized avatars, that's really not that far off. Um, we've been doing VR studies and things like that more recently where you have things like the Oculus Rift representing full 3D realities. Uh, you have people wearing haptic devices that physically shake your hands or like make you feel like you've been hit if something hits you in a 3D space. I would not be surprised if things like Ready Player One are fully realized within the next five to 10 years. And you can just go with your friends to some warehouse that's just filled with nothing but big white empty boxes and they map the full reality onto it and you play almost like a 3D paintball kind of thing in a fully visualized almost video game real life hybrid, which that would just be super cool. I, I would imagine this is something that will likely happen uh, for my kids as they get older. Um, but you can see sort of the death of the, the static video game player sitting in a chair with a controller and the birth of the almost physical virtual reality player where you need both the physical and the mental acuity to kind of do it all, uh, which would just be amazing. Um, but a, a, a quicker way to kind of crystallize that whole idea is there was this post on Reddit that was a, one of those Today I Learned, and if you think about it this way, it really helps frame it up. It said, Today I, I Learned it's only been 125,000 generations since the emergence of the human species, and then it's been 75,000 or 7,500 generations since human physiology reached what is essentially its modern state, 500 generations since the agricultural revolution, and only 20 generations since the scientific revolution. So again, this, this rapid condensing of information and kind of gains stacking on gains. And we're getting to a point where everything is so increased that more advancement is likely to happen in the next 20 years than happened in the last 2000 years um, in terms of society outpacing itself. Um, and usually when I give these lectures, I interject little pieces of like random life advice. And the life advice embedded in this one would be to just embrace change because regardless of who you are watching this video, your profession and skill set are going to change a lot in the next decade. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You just need to sort of be on the, the crest of that wave and ride it to a more positive place. Because if you graduate college with kind of a fixed mindset and you think, these are my skills and look for a job to apply them, you're going to be very frustrated as companies continue to adapt and expect you to learn new things. Um, so just embrace change. It's, it's a very, growth mindset is probably one of the best things you can have when it comes to uh, advancing your career and just advancing your life in general. Um, but back to the topic at hand, um, our tools to, to the point of being at hand, our tools today are still very much passive. Um, and if you think of somebody like using a wooden chisel to chisel out, you know, an art deco display or something, you think like, yeah, that's a passive tool, you're hitting it. But really, even computers today are really passive as well. You're, you're, you're typing, you're physically hitting a keyboard, um, or you're taking a mouse and moving it around a screen or even a touchpad or whatever the gesture might be. Um, but these passive tools really limit the ability for us to get information out of our heads or out of our bodies into the computer device. Um, and if you think about it that way, I mean, we're really not that much farther from the monkey hitting the, the stack of bones at the beginning of 2001. Like we are still just 
graduated apes smashing buttons and hitting things. Um, the, re the next evolution is going to come when we take our tools and make them no longer passive and start to make them generative. Um, and that's the idea that we're just going to supply a computer with the capabilities and things that we want to see happen and then just let the computer hash it out. So nowadays, if you've worked in any sort of creative discipline, you've probably heard of a brief or been given a brief at some point. And that brief takes all of the high level considerations from design to messaging to marketing to aesthetics and tries to give the designer a footing, kind of a foundation to start on and says, build something that satisfies this criteria. Um, that would be a very passive way of attacking a problem. A generative way would be to give those same constraints to a computer and let it just visualize literally every possible option that facilitates those requirements. Um, and this could be millions or billions of different iterations. Uh, Autodesk did a really great sort of primer on this idea for some of their generative design software. Um, and they were building a drone and basically said like it needs four propellers, it needs to be wind, have good wind resistant characteristics. Um, you know, all the things that you would expect of a drone and then just let the simulation run out millions of conceivable options and draw down on the total amount of materials and cost efficiency and all of that stuff. And it just iterated through billions of options and spit out things that no human would think to design at face value. Uh, and ironically, some of them even came out looking very similar to like the pelvis of a flying squirrel, which kind of goes to reinforce the the evolution of species here on the planet, that whole idea of biomimicry. Um, but taking constraints and having a, a computer hash out the details just leads to infinitely more variety and sort of makes the, the artist become more of a conductor and less of a specifier, if that makes sense. Um, so this whole idea of just like hashing out millions of ideas is starting to spill out everywhere. There's even a, a company called, I think it's like Photos, or generated dot photos or something like that. There's a link down below and probably a video up there um, where an AI is just crunching millions of images of faces and kind of remixing fake people. And we're starting to generate fake stock photos um, whereby you can actually have stock photos of people in various you know, states, but no model release is required because the people don't actually exist. They're just really complex remixed iterations of other people. They, they've blended the eyes and the mouth and everything. Um, and that idea at face value on its own is insane, but we're really starting to take every level of analysis of the design process and just feed it into a computer and see what starts coming out. Um, and if you've watched any of my other lectures, you know that things that were once industrial design exercises are quickly becoming graphic design exercises because we're taking physical buttons and manipulatives and turning them into digital interfaces, uh, either by touch devices or things like iPhones, iPads, and things like that. And Surface tablets, all that stuff. And so in doing so, we have to come up with new ways to tackle these things. Um, and you might wonder like, okay, so all of this crazy generative AI stuff is going on. What does that specifically look like for the graphic design field? Um, and some, you know, Trigger warning, a lot of this stuff is probably gonna turn your stomach, but it looks a lot like this. This is where we'll begin the process of making your logo. The first step is to enter your company name. Here we see a page filled with different styles and layouts of other people's logos. Take a moment to think hard about the colors you'd like to represent your brand and what you want these colors to communicate. Click continue and we'll find all the different elements that we just selected have come to life. LogoJoy's artificial intelligence has taken the name, colors, slogan, and symbol to generate seemingly endless options. Introducing Wix ADI, artificial design intelligence. With Wix.com, you can create your own stunning website. Tell us who you are and what you do. Then Wix artificial design intelligence learns what you need and creates a stunning website for you. You've got a business to grow, but that takes time. Fiverr to the rescue. Freelance services for lean entrepreneurs like you. Logos, social media, website design. You need it, we got it. So you need some branding? Let's start with logo design. It's all here. Smart filtering helps you find your style, price that fits your budget, and your timeline. Wow, that could not have been easier. Now, 
Pick a service. Nice. Check out the gallery. Compare options. Read reviews. And ask questions. When you're ready, order. Boom. They'll do their magic. Ta-da! Wow, that looks awesome. Love it? Rate them. Now, get out that toilet or wherever you are and grow your business. Fiverr. Needless to say, that stuff is frustrating, but let's just, you know, spare a moment for the poor bastard illustrated in this video here. Because just even looking at this one screen, we have all sorts of errors, like days is spelled wrong with a D at the end. The beginning of the sentence isn't capitalized. You've got the dollar sign on the wrong side of the money here. The word logo is inexplicably capitalized. Here they call it options, there they call it packages. Like all of this stuff is just deeply frustrating to anybody who does design for a living because you're like, you're not proofing anything. It's littered with errors. Why would anyone pay $50 for a logo? Like, this pisses me off. And that's fine because that is the reaction you should have if you're somebody who's going into design to mitigate these things. Um, but when you think that, you probably think some variation of these sentiments, like, you know, only an idiot would use these services, or, you know, I'm amazing at design, I'm much more valuable than some template or some generative design solution, or maybe just at face value, you look at stuff like that and you go, that's just bad, that's bad design, I wouldn't use it, anybody should be able to tell that that's bad. Um, and to that, I would sort of posit this Louis C.K. joke back to you to, to frame it up a little bit differently. You know, like when you say to a friend of yours, you're, you're being an asshole, and they're like, no, I'm not. Well, it's not up to you if you're an asshole or not. That's up to everybody else. You don't get to say no to that. You're an asshole. No, I'm not. Oh, sorry. I thought, okay, I'm glad I checked. I guess you're not. And so, yeah, it, what, my whole viewpoint on that is like, it's not up to you. Like, yeah, we agree it's bad design, but like you're effectively just pointing at these sites and saying, you're bad, stop existing. And they go, no, I'm fine. Like I have clients, I'm not bad. So it's really not up to the design community as a whole, whether or not these systems exist. There will always be a client for this type of system. Um, it's really more up to you to provide a layer of expertise that outpaces this type of system. Um, and so, there's a video here, I think it's by Vox, that explains kind of the differences in how an AI attacks a problem and how a human attacks a problem. And it spells out at great length how a system can read information and parse sentences and do complex summaries and pull in images to make very quickly summarized videos. Um, but the one thing a computer can't do is sort of that level of wisdom below that, where it synthesizes a, a broader narrative from the information, or understands how to make a complex narrative out of everything that's been pulled together. Um, they even show a clip from like a sci-fi movie that was written entirely by an AI, and it's just hilariously bad and full of trite non sequiturs. But that idea is where the design profession and probably most artistic professions are heading. Um, and the key points really are, technology doesn't have what humans have in the sense that as of right now, and you know, give it 10 years, this could change, but as of right now, it doesn't really have an understanding of why things are happening. Um, and then on top of that, technology is only so good as the information that we provide it. Um, and I think this is an interesting thing to wrap your head around because it, it parallels nicely with what I see happen in design all the time where people say, you know, the client always picks the worst logo or no one picks the one I like, they pick the bad stuff. And it's like, a client can only review what you give to them. Same thing here, like an AI can only give you a good solution if you give it good data. Um, so the key point of providing a clear path and understanding why that path exists is really where the designer is gonna, of the future is gonna live. Um, and just as like a fun sort of weird aside with all of this machine learning nonsense, um, I was doing a Facebook ad once and Facebook has you upload your images to where you can check to see if they have too much text in them because they say if you have too much text, they're gonna have a lower ad reach. So you wanna make sure that it runs through this tool to make sure that it reaches the largest audience it can. Um, and the hilarious part is, is it's clearly not a human evaluating the image. You upload it into this tool and then it quickly says like, hey, your image has too much text, trim it down. Um, and as I was dealing with this, this thing, it kept saying this image of the Grateful Dead logo had too much text. 
Uh, and I quickly realized that even after I stripped all of the text out of the ad, it still had a low reach. Um, and clearly the machine learning was looking at, I'm assuming the, the vertical striations of the teeth there and the stark white on black changing and thinking it was text. Um, so I was like, I'm kind of screwed. That image needs to be in there and there's no way that it's not gonna read it as text. Uh, but then I actually thought back to that Vox video, which pointed out how quickly we can make a machine learning system fail just by adding little amounts of noise to an image. Um, in their example, they took an image of a panda that had like 91% um, or sorry, 57% confidence that an image could be analyzed as a panda and they just threw a little bit of colorful noise over top of it and then all of a sudden it thought it was a gibbon with 99% confidence. It was like, that's a gibbon. Um, and this just shows you how drastically machine learning can fail just getting tripped up by little color variations. So I did the same thing. I just took a little field of colored noise, uh, like in Photoshop, you know, image, generate, noise, Gaussian, 1%, and just applied it over top of the image. It was so superficial, you couldn't even really see it. But if you zoomed in, a machine could see it, and anything analyzing each pixel would see it. Um, and upon applying that over my image and uploading it into their tool, it got approved just fine, which is, Frustrating, hilarious, and weird all at the same time that we, we've arrived here as a society. It's just like, ugh. Um, but anyway, to, to kind of summarize where that lands us, you know, I kind of went into the design industry back around 2006, I was getting started, and a website might look something like this, where you a website needed four people and 40 plus hours from each of those four people. It might cost $40,000, and then at the end, you have kind of a nice functioning website. Whereas today, you know, you need a website and it takes one person less than eight hours and less than 2000 bucks to make that same website because templates and code validation and everything are just so much more streamlined. Um, so where you end up is the same. It's just how you get there that's changed and it will continue to change. Uh, and um, to that point, you're really not competing with stuff like this. And I know it really feels like you are, and I've even lost jobs to stuff like this, where people say, you know, oh, that's too expensive for my taste. I'm just gonna go to 99designs and get a logo. Or why are you charging 300 for a logo when I can go here and get one for 30? And it's like, Ugh. But at the same time, you don't wanna work with somebody who would only pay $30 for a logo anyway. Like that's not your job. Your job is to be sort of the, the customer service interface through the design process. You're, you're gonna hold the client's hand, hear, hear their issues, hear their rationales, and build them to a future that includes the design that they wanna see. Um, you're not just gonna be like, here's the solution, and if you don't like it, meh. Like, that's just a bad way to approach design. It's very much more a customer service position where, for lack of a better term, like the client is always right. You need to help them arrive at the right um, destination. And I've got another lecture that explains how, how it's your job to more educate them than convince them, but that's the nugget there. You're, you're an educating force, not a convincing force. Um, and so kind of the high level takeaway here is just that the tools you use to do your job are evolving. You should be hyper aware of what's going on in this space because it could change you know, in a heartbeat over the next couple of years. Um, and a lot of that can feel scary, it can feel daunting, and you might think like, uh, you know, anxiety level increases kind of thing. Um, so I usually just end this with a bunch of inspirational quotes. And I feel like they really hit the nail on the head for where things are heading. So this one from John Gold, he's one of the design technologists at Airbnb. He says, I'm building design tools that integrate intelligent algorithms with the design process tools that try to make designers better by learning about what they're doing, what we're doing, augmenting rather than replacing. Um, or this one here from Claire Waring, the executive creative director at Sapient Nitro. She says, AI is going to bring with it an explosion of creative possibilities that shortcut the digital design process. A designer's role will evolve to that of directing, selecting, fine tuning rather than making. The craft will, be in having vision and skill in selecting initial machine-made concepts, pushing them further rather than making from scratch. Designers will become conductors rather than musicians. Um, and there's something kind of beautiful there because I think a lot of people 
get hung up and feel that again that anxiety about it but really that's been the the designer career path trajectory from the get-go you start as a production designer where you just take orders from on high and are a grunt and then you become you know a graphic designer a senior designer you have a little more autonomy but generally speaking the step after that is to become an art director or a creative director where you are just more of a conducting directive force over people actually producing the work um, and what we're seeing is the elevation of everyone up to the conductor level to begin with. So who knows what that's gonna do for the, the art director and creative director roles kind of en masse, but at base level, sort of at the rising tide is lifting all ships. Everyone is being lifted out of this production drudgery more rapidly than ever before. Um, and where I would leave that is just like, articles like this, where the Microsoft chief technology officer basically said, understanding AI is going to be part of being an informed citizen in the 21st century. Um, and that's kind of the whole purpose of this lecture. Like you should understand this stuff and know where it's going because as he's quoted as saying, you want to be an active agent in this ecosystem. Because I think as soon as you are, um, it's not gonna feel like this is just like being done to you, like the machine is just grinding you into a dust. It's gonna be more that you are seeing it coming and you're, part, you're participating in how this affects where your career goes. Um, kind of like Alan Watts said, like as soon as you realize this duality of existence, I think it was what he was talking about at the time, but like you won't feel so much as you're just like rattling around down there, kind of mercy to the will of the universe. You, you are acting in concert rather with everything that is happening. Um, I feel like I need to put a clip in here because that, that reference probably made zero sense, so. Duality is always secretly unity. So yeah, that's kind of the high, the high level takeaway is really just embrace change, try to learn new things. Um, what you're doing is going to remain constant, but how you do it is very much gonna change. Uh, try to empathize and understand the importance of a consumer or a user's experience because Graphic design really is more of a customer service position than anything else. Um, and then just be excited. Like you are in a pivotal career that is not only going to change and malform over the coming decade here, but you are going to be in a role that sort of helps meld what that is. Uh, and as you've probably seen from other lectures of mine, I very much feel like graphic design is helping shape the, the very value structure of our society as a whole, uh, in the sense that, you know, a poorly designed cereal box generally feels like it would taste worse than a well-designed cereal box. Um, and that whole idea of you helping construct societal value with the underlying notion that how we technologically get there is going to be shaped by this as well, just puts a tremendous amount of importance and gravitas on the role. And I think that can help pull you forward in a very incentivizing way to being a better, more engaged designer in this space. So. That's the topic, I hope you found it interesting. If you like these more kind of lecture form videos, uh, let me know, comments, likes, subscribes, all the weird YouTube stuff, and I will see you at the next one.